Hello everyone, this is Brett and thank you for tuning in. Today we're going to be ranking the albums of the Psychedelic Furs. I have a special guest, my friend Frank Deserto. Hello Frank. Hello Brett. Frank, uh, I've known for over 20 years, I think. Uh, he writes for postpunk.com. He has his own blog, Systems of Romance, and is uh, a member of the band The Harrow, as well as uh, compiling, writing the liner notes for the Cherry Red compilation, Cherry Stars Collide, which focuses on dream pop, shoegaze, and ethereal rock from 1986 to 1995, a four disc set, which I posted a review of, which I'll leave a link for in the description. Yeah. So today we're talking about the psychedelic furs. You ready, Frank? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Excellent, excellent. So um, let's. I'm just going to give a quick backdrop on the psychedelic furs for those of you that may be unfamiliar. I think casual listeners know one of three songs, or maybe all three songs. I think we can probably all agree: "Love My Way," "The Ghost in You," "Pretty in Pink." So if you're like, "Who are the psychedelic furs?" I'm sure watching you watching. Uh, no one of those three songs, maybe all of them. Uh, they formed in 1977 in London by two brothers, Richard and Tim Butler. Uh, we can kind of categorize them in the post-punk, new wave, alternative. They've released eight albums in the span from 1980 to 2020. Uh, their original run lasted from 1977 to 1992, and then they reformed in 2000. And here we are. All right, so... Um, we're also going to be doing a part two of this and Frank and I are going to endeavor to rank our 25 favorite psychedelic furs and side projects, meaning love spit love and Richard Butler solo. We're going to be posting that video after this. So be sure to subscribe, turn on the notifications. So, you know, when that's live. Um, so Frank psychedelic furs, what was your familiarity with the band and your familiarity with all eight albums? Goodness. Okay. So to get things started, I first heard of the Psychedelic Furs, like many uh, new fans have heard of so those three singles, those three songs, uh, especially Love My Way and Pretty in Pink. As a teen in a small town in upstate New York, that was really as far as it got. That was really all you can really hear. You saw the, you know, saw the movies Pretty in Pink. You heard uh, like Love My Way, I think it was featured in The Wedding Singer. So when I was kind of in high school, that was, oh, wow, this song, I remember this song. That was, and they still heard those songs on the radio constantly. Uh, it wasn't until college, I believe, that I got really into them. And the first record I ever heard of theirs in full was Book of Days, which is surprising. It's a very surprising choice. I was working at the college radio station, WONY in Oneonta, New York. And a girl I was dating at the time, my first band uh, in college, sat me down on a couch and made me listen to Book of Days, primarily the track Torch. And that was my first familiarity with them. And it blew my mind. I just that whole record uh, just resonated deeply and then i went backwards and then i went backwards to the catalog picked up the first record forever now talk 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 couldn't find the others for a little while so as i moved down to the city is when i really became a huge fan my first year living here i got in, i joined a band called the funeral crashers who were very Bauhausy, very you know glam bowie big goth band you know my very first real band and we all loved the first and that's kind of where it exploded for me we covered several tracks on the first record are we always i think we're compared to Bauhaus a bit too much but i think furs were more fitting for us and so it was a big thing and i saw them live a couple times and that's where i really kind of enveloped so i was familiar with most of the records the two i would say that i didn't really listen to as much before doing this ranking were midnight to midnight and world outside which um not for any real reason for world outside world outside it was just a matter of not having a physical copy of it uh being kind of it's a cd only kind of jam harder to find and when i was there and uh midnight to midnight i just kind of had a low opinion of it so i didn't really think of it too much and didn't really care uh to to do it until we got these rankings and i figured i'd pick up a copy and give it a, an honest shot so that's my story i'm sticking to it Excellent, yeah. excellent. Uh, for for myself, um, you know, this doing this ranking and and as Frank and I, as we were talking before we started filming, is you know I've done a lot of these artist rankings and this was the one I had the most difficult with. There were bands, um, you know, even The Cure, David Bowie, U two, even like you know James Depeche Mode, where there were clear bottom tier albums oh, 
Oh, yeah. Not the case at all on this one. This took, um, this this was a up till the last minute. I was up last night until till two in the morning, you know, contemplating these uh, these decisions. And and I know you went through that <laughs> this uh, morning. I was up until we up until we started recording and yeah. met, I was changing it all around. So I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, we're, we're just gonna, uh, get right, right down to it. We don't know each other's picks. We have not discussed that. And, uh, one thing we're going to do before, before, right before we start is, uh, we, uh, I asked Frank to write down what he thinks my number one's going to be. I wrote down what I think his number one's going to be. We're going to reveal that at the end after we, uh, we reveal that. And, um, let's kick it off with number eight, Frank, you're first. All right, so number eight for me is a record that I've actually defended of theirs for a long time and really loved and still love, actually. Like Brett says, this has really been difficult to put something at the bottom is kind of, I don't want to insult it very much, but for me, it's actually 1984's Mirror Moves LP is my bottom pick, which is, I don't like saying that out loud because, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's produced by, uh, who is it, by Keith Forsey, and that's mm -hmm. his first and only foray in the psychedelic first world i believe and really this album is chock chock full of bangers there's really nothing bad on it there let's see what did i have here to say about it? so it's glossy right so really a lot of people's complaints that it's a very glossy pop-minded record and but it's a really great collection of songs it's not perfect um the lyrics are really good i think he's always been an amazing lyricist if not somewhat repetitive he has his themes like trains and uh nostalgia and all these things but really this this is there's nothing wrong with it but um it's very much of its time which i think uh you know is kind of maybe to its detriment and maybe i wasn't in the mood for it as much when i listened to it, but here, here we are so i think even the songs that start out very glossy and poppy would be you know are, are still have like they build and have bite to them so there's really it's not bad so um i think we'll do should we do some favorite songs yeah three let's pick three faves great Cool. So my favorite on this one by far is High Wire Days, the closing track. That nice track man. does kill me. I find it to be very, the way he kind of does like an in the round version of the little bit, you know, the whole bit mm -hmm. at the end. Kind of, and it just, that's 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 how you end an album. That's really how you end an album. I love it, the way it fades away and just kind of leaves you, I don't know, just feeling a certain way. But you can also dance to it. So that's my favorite. Second favorite track, Heartbeat, which is a track that I thought, didn't think much of when it started again this time. But again, that's one that picked up bite as it went along. By the end, I'm like, oh, yeah, dang. And then um, my third favorite, Alice's House, which was originally demoed for Forever Now and appears here. It's a, it's, it's a great song. They just, coincidentally, they just played in Phoenix two nights ago, and they played in Tucson last night. I have friends that texted me that I haven't responded to that were, you know, very excited to be there. And they actually did Alice's house at the, on the set list for the, for the Phoenix show, which was, which was cool to see. Um, yeah. All right. So you went with mirror moves at number, at number eight. All right. So, yeah, sue me. <laughs> all right, there we go. Um, my number eight, I'm going to go with 1982's forever now. <laughs> Their third album, produced by Todd Rundgren, of course. Everyone knows this has the backing vocals from Flo and Eddie of the Turtles, which I'm not the biggest fan of. It was also their first album after they lost two of their original members, um, Duncan Kilborn, the sax player, guitar player Roger Morris. Uh, what's interesting is I, I'm reading a book on the early days of the Sisters of Mercy, and Duncan Kilborn was one of the pivotal members in getting Sisters of Mercy kind of discovered um andrew elder had given him a demo tape and uh unlike other people that get demo tapes and throw it in the trash he actually listened to it and they were listening to it in the psychedelic for his touring van which i thought was kind of kind of interesting um it, it includes one of my least favorite psychedelic fur songs danger and that's probably why it's putting it down in the bottom tier but once again you know it's do I like Forever Now? Of course I do. Number eight doesn't mean I don't like this album because I really do. It's just everything after it I like more. Um, but, uh, and, and we should also acknowledge uh, the first three albums have different US, UK album covers. There's the original UK. The track listing is kind of jumbled and rearranged for US. Um, I'm most familiar with the U.S. edition. That's the one I kind of grew up with. Um, favorite songs on this one? 
And, and some of these songs we're going to be talking about in more detail when we do our uh, song ranking video. But my absolute favorite one on this one is Sleep Comes Down. Um, that real kind of Peter Hook, Joy, Div Joy Division-esque heavy chorus drummed bass. The title track, Forever Now, which, you know, is for me the better opening track because the UK opens with President Gas. That's uh, that's uh, Side 2's opener on, on the US one, but Forever Now and then President Gas. So I'm going to commit to that right now as number eight, Forever Now. Oh, all right yes <laughs> all right frank it's your number seven all right my number seven for me was the one that i said i was very unfamiliar with and had a very low opinion of but really uh and number seven is going to be 1986's midnight midnight and not for nothing this record was i loved it when i played it the other day yeah and i'm going to confess that i think we sarah and i my partner and i were drinking some champagne uh and we were getting a little tipsy off of it but i think that really only made me enjoy it more uh, and I actually, I thought, I thought that might've been a fluke. Maybe oh, he was drunk lush. Maybe it wasn't so good. And I listened to it again today just to make sure I felt that way about it. And I, it still hit me. So this one is, you know, it's kind of a little cheesy, obviously it de definitely goes a way more commercial than, uh, Mirror Moves does. It's just really running for it as far as like, oh, we, the ghost of you took off. So let's just make more like that. So obviously heartbreak beat was a radio smash and you still hear that one to date, but really though, it's got a lot of corkers as well. It's not as coherent. Uh, and I feel bad that I haven't spent as much time with it over the years. So I kind of wanted more of this album after hearing it. And I felt it was very, it was kind of short. Uh, so it didn't really wear out its welcome either. So favorite three tracks off this one, Shock. Shock in every version. I even listened to the remixes of doing this. Shock just rules. Shock was really a great track. One More Word was my second favorite. And All of the Law as my third favorite. Ooh. Yeah. So yeah, number number seven, Midnight to Midnight. Excellent. All right. My number seven, Midnight to Midnight. Now, to so I love this album. I know this album gets kind of panned by people. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and I saw them play, I think it was in 2016, they played up in northern Arizona underneath the Stars and Flagstaff um, with the church opening. And they did a good chunk of this album live. And hearing it, you know, whatever many 30 years after it came out uh, those songs were incredibly powerful and it was also good to see them acknowledging those songs and playing them live and we're talking like deeper cuts um this one produced by uh, chris kimsey did a lot of stones i mean killing joke the colts dream time peter tosh so a really wide variety and did you know that um ed bowler plays keyboards on this the original producer of suede Sweet. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, played with my friends Blacklist. Uh, played on that record as well. So, oh, really? And, Interesting. Yeah, Bowler, yeah. And this guy. is also the um, we see Mars Williams, the sax player on this, and uh, doing a little research on Mars Williams. Uh, he grew up not, I mean, within like I don't know five miles from where I grew up in the Chicago area. So that was kind of cool to see as well. Um, favorite songs, number one, without a doubt all of the law we'll talk about that more when we get to our our, our song ranking but uh that guitar riff in the beginning just that song is top tier depeche depeche mode psychedelic first i was thinking about depeche mode on their new album there's a riff of the guitar that's reminiscent of all the that from all the law um i'm a huge fan of angels don't cry i think that's just a beautiful pop song and heartbreak beat i mean that's just such a such a great track. So I'm going with this as, as my number seven as well. Nice. And Heartbreak Beat was the only song they played live when I saw them from this record. They played a very balanced set, and I uh, feel like that was the right choice at the time, but I kind of wish I heard a few more of those cuts. Yeah. So shock, yeah, Shock especially, All the Law, like you said. So cool. Excellent. Um, we're, at, we're, we're number six, Frank. OK, number six, I changed. To, this, this is one of those ones that I had actually high and I put down below, and 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 here it is. It it, it is going to be forever now. Interesting. Yeah. So the Todd Rungan produced 1980. Was it two? No. Yeah, 82 record. Uh, and again, I'm gonna double what Brett said. And so the track listing of this one's confusing. And I listened to. I, I kind of assessed both. I kind of grew up with the U.S. one, but by grew up, I mean we already went through my not grew up, but had my moments with. And this is the one I've always had. 
And I, I really do think that President Gas is a weird opening track and doesn't work for me. So opening with the title track does make most sense to me as well. So this one, yeah, I find uh, find this to be really the way to go. It has a better flow. That way, I feel like as far as their, their songwriting here, they're not fighting the pop songs as much on this one. That I find actually Love My Way to be irrefutably great. And as overplayed as it is, I don't get sick of it. Some of the other songs I get sick of hearing. I don't really want to hear Ghost, Ghost in You or Pretty in Pink all the time. But Love My Way, I always have room for. So the production, though, uh, like like Brett said about the, the backing vocals and also the Todd Rundgren, Rundgren bombast is sometimes a bit exhausting on this mm -hmm. record. But it's still, songwriting-wise, pretty solid. So my three favorites are going to be No Easy Street, which is a nice, gloomy, moody mo moment. Second favorite for me is President Gas uh, and everything but Roller Skates, man. And third <laughs> track, third favorite track is Goodbye, which is mm. a uh, one song I didn't think much of, and I played it more and more, and it just kept sticking with me. And I played it around, I played a dance version of it uh, uh, today, and my, kid, my son Gavin was just like, put this on my playlist immediately. <laughs> so goodbye really hit and when i saw them the first time they played five five tracks in this one uh, only you and i got played sleep comes down which is brett's favorite and not a not not a stinker there um anyway so yeah and this one actually i had a lot higher and i changed today but it's still a great record so yeah 1982 forever now my number six all right my my number six you know these some of these are just tough to put in the in this territory um you know, Psychedelic Fur's first couple albums, uh, you know, very much uh, in kind of the post-punk realm. And you and I both have heavy backgrounds in post-punk. And so uh, I was surprised where I'm putting this one, but I ended up putting Talk, Talk, Talk at number six. Um, Yo, your idols. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Steve Lillywhite produced, he produced, uh, produced their, you know, their, their first two albums. Uh, came from doing the Banshees, you know, XTC would do U2's debut, or actually U2's first three records, um, and he has a long storied career. Once again, um, different US and UK uh, running orders, the US one opens with with Pretty in Pink. Um, you know, the uh, a lot of people know that 1986 version of Pretty in Pink that uh, was was re recorded for the for the movie of the same name. Um, this original version is the definitive version. Um, and, uh, you know, I love that song so much. It's just, you know, yeah. Pretty in Pink, I'm going to go with my number one favorite on this one. I'm going to go with Dumb Waiters as my number two. And I'm going to go with She Is Mine as my number third pick. So that is number six, 1981, their second album, Talk, Talk, Talk. All right. So that brings us to number five. Number five. That's how the that's how map goes. And so for my number five, I don't have a physical copy of this one, so I printed out the cover real quick. I didn't even cut it out. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go with, go with <laughs> 1991's World Outside record, which is one of the ones I was least familiar with going into this. Uh, I listened to it a few times, liked it a lot. And so that's my number five. It's produced by Stephen Street. Yes. And generally, I love Stephen Street. So I, I, uh, since I was young... Cranberries, Blur, uh, The Smiths, like Stephen Street was in my lifeblood of the sad, melancholy, sad little high school kid. So I mean, it was in my, just in my veins, really. So his production on here is fantastic. And I personally, as much as like Brett said, we love the post-punk stuff. The, the, the best part about the first to me is that they've evolved and matured and felt like they're, they're hitting a more emotional core. Back at the beginning, I felt maybe they were a bit like, Kind of going into like this world of word associations and, and just making things rhyme and sound good and have like a bit of a we'll get to more about this later actually yeah but i feel like true, the true. Emotion, but i feel like the emotional weight of the band it actually they got like shallower and shallower and then all of a sudden came back with uh, all that money wants after minute to midnight and that was a stephen street joint and afterwards it's kind of hit that level of just like having this emotional connection and really going there with it so this record really does have a lot of weight to it and uh, it was thought as beautiful, it was soulful, heartfelt, more modern sounding. Uh, you know, it's hard to pick a couple standouts because I just felt it was such a big mood piece. It had a lot of textures. I think Knox Chandler, who also played with the Creatures, the band mm -hmm. when they reunited um, I, and stayed with them. For, I think I saw Knox Chandler with the Furs a couple of times. Uh, it just, he's a great guitar player and he's really great about that mood. So I think the whole record is just, that's what I feel about it. It's just one 
kind of block of tracks. And um, I like I listened to the B-sides. I thought some of those were really great. So my favorites off this one, let's see. We have In My Head, which I thought was a clear Absolutely. banger. And then Valentine is my second favorite. Mm -hmm. And third favorite, which is the opening track. And second, uh, third favorite is All About You. Great, great so, choice. Yeah. World Outside, number five, 1991. Excellent, excellent. All right. This one pains me to for number five, but everything has to go somewhere. Um, I'm going to go with the debut, 1980. Uh, as I mentioned a little, on my mind. a little while ago. Yeah, I mean, this was, there was no, this list, as, as we were talking about ahead of time, uh, Sarah and I had these on the eight cubes. And as we listened to them, we kept rearranging them into the order and things kept changing. And, and this one, I really struggled with where to put it at because I, you know, like I said, I love these albums. Um, once again, different US and UK album covers, different track listings. In this case, this album has, uh, the UK had the song Black's Radio, where the uh, US didn't have it on, and it had a couple songs produced by Martin Hammett, famed for you know the Joy Division records, and it had Susan Strange and Soap commercial on it. Um, three favorites, um, Imitation of Christ, Sister Europe, and you know, um, I'm going to go with this one because I, I just love the song and I am a fan of Martin Hannett's production style. I love Susan Strange and I'm going to go with that, even though it wasn't on the original um, original UK. But if we if we're going to uh, dispute if there's dispute over that, how about I just say India as well, because that opening track is just you know, that announces the psychedelic furs on their first album here with uh, which I've seen them do it live. And it's, of course, this just rambunctious, intense cacophony. <laughs> yeah. So Great there it is. That I saw. There's my number five. Excellent. Good choice. Uh, all right. So my number four, uh, this also moved around and it is Talk, Talk, Talk for me. Uh, I realized today, I didn't listen to my LP for this because I have the U.S. edition, which starts with Free and Pink. And I prefer, when I listen to the my album rankings, I listen to the U.K. version. I still have a problem with either Free and Pink and Dumb Waiters opening this record. I don't think either are a great opening track. Uh, I think Into You Like a Train, which is mm. a great song, would have yeah. been the opener on this. And I feel like, I wonder if maybe they thought like the issue was this is kind of too similar to India in the same... Capacity. Oh, it has that is that that moody intro, and then it rollicks along like a big train. So maybe we didn't want to do that twice. I can. Right. But it seems to me like this this whole record has sequencing problems, which is it. We talked about this before. We said maybe that wouldn't affect the ring, but it kind of did because it, as, this is a great collection of songs. But it really order really drives me crazy. Um, yeah. So it's Steve Lillywhite White, who you know Brett said all of these good things about him, and great, another great producer. And so, oh yeah, but oh, the other one, it should, it should also end, I think, with All of This and Nothing, which doesn't, the UK version doesn't, the US one gets that right, at least, mm -hmm. but otherwise, it's just frustrating how this, this album has never been, I've never, I've never found a perfect, the good thing is in the digital era, you can make your own track <laughs> you want, but I haven't gotten that far yet, I haven't gotten that far yet. So my favorite three tracks here, All of This and Nothing, mm -hmm. which I think is just, a, again, closing the song to me, and it just has that, that, that weight to it. Uh, into like a train and uh mr jones number three so talk 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 number great three. choice is number four all right so um I, those of you watching you know which which albums are, are 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 left here so this starts to get even more uh stressful and exciting to to observe um once again neither frank nor i know our what our the list is what each other's lists are are so i'm gonna go with number four i'm gonna go with world outside uh, this was their seventh album, 1991. Um, I think Frank's gasping because I have the vinyl edition of it. I didn't know that existed. I, di I didn't even think it was a thing. Yes. Uh, yeah, they did a reissue back in 2018, and it was super hard to find. But I ended up finding um, Oh, Von, Von Oliver um, did the artwork for this. Oh, $18. Yeah, on. so... You're all add, <laughs> add to cart. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I knew if Frank got to this one before I, I, I did, I knew he would bring up Stephen Street because I know his love for the Cranberries and, and Blur. So uh, so I second all of that. Um, 
So this was their their kind of last album before they took a long hiatus in that interim. Richard Butler did, you know, Love Spit Love. Um, and, and then they released an album a whole 29 years after this. This is definitely um, more stripped down, some a lot more acoustic guitars present. Um, in my head, you already referenced, that is the number one song for me. I remember seeing them. I drove out to San Diego and saw them um, at the House of Blues there. And of, of all bands, the Happy Mondays were supporting them. And they did In My Head that night and was just blown away by that. Um, Until She Comes, which uh, I mean, just love that song. And then Get a Room is my third favorite. And of course, we'll be getting deeper into these songs in that in that 25 song ranking video because I have some extra things to say about some of these songs. So um, I'm going with number four, World Outside. And let me ask you this, Brett, is that the copy that's a mispress? Because I almost just ordered a mispressed version of it that has Book of Days on it instead. So um, um, it has the the label looks great, but I, I apparently that's why it's so cheap right now. And I'm going to take a moment and pause and not be so impulsive next time and, fi- and make sure that I buy the correct yeah, version. Mine is, mine is totally legit. There's no issues with any... Uh... Any track listing? Is that the 20, 2018 reissue? 2018 says mispress, misprint, and it does have a problem with Book of Days being pressed to it instead of this. So, oh. uh, you know, got to do a little. Yeah, little no, I- up on that. no issue on my end on that, but uh, right. did not know well, that. Yeah, so I'm going to do a little homework on that and make sure I don't order the wrong copy. Yeah, com- anyway. com- complete the collection. Yep. All right. All right. It's, it's top three, Frank. Here we go. Number three, and it pains me to put it at number three because this record is one of my favorites of 2020, Made of Rain. Make it rain with Made it Rain. <laughs> uh, here we are. Uh, so yes, like the first Made of Rain, the 2020 record that we all thought would never come out. Uh, as the time came, uh, I actually kind of forgot how much I loved them over the last maybe 10 years. I saw them live twice in the early 2000s. My time in my band came and went where we worshipped them, and I just never stopped, but it never, the, the obsession kind of dwindled. And they had the one new track that was kind of sitting there, sitting pretty. We'll get to more about that later. Uh, but otherwise it just seemed like, like, oh, and they had played, uh, both times they'd seen them, they played the song called Wrong Train. And it was a highlight. It was a huge highlight of their live shows. And I was like, when is this song ever going to come out? So all of a sudden in the middle of the pandemic, right at the beginning of the pandemic, this just like, oh yeah, we have a new album out. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. It's 2021. This came out, not 2020. So I think it's 2020. Out. Is it? Well, I think it's way, yeah. Long story short, uh, it was well, oh, it's twenty twenty. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So pandemic record. Uh, I'm sure they've been sitting on this for a long time, and I thought it was such a comeback. And like we talked about, how they matured, right? So the, the, it really felt like this is a record, not of a band that was going to go back and redo their early stuff. So many reunion records do that. Like even like, and I don't even necessarily mind that. I don't mind when a band goes back and recaptures their old sound, goes back to that, and if they do it well, that's okay. This is just its own record. It doesn't sound like maybe World Outside and Book of Days kind of point towards this, but really it's its own thing. And it's beautiful. And every song of it is just, just ugh, gets you right in the feels. Um, yeah, that's that's it. It's good. So the yeah, Wrong Train to me always felt, that's my favorite song on here, period. And it always yeah. was. It's kind of like their True Love Waits, if you will, from Radiohead, where it's like the song's been sitting around. So yeah, so good. And uh, Second favorite, it was the first single off this, Don't Believe. And my third favorite, which kills me and almost makes me cry, is This Will Never Be Like Love. <sighs> oh, so good. Number three, Made, it, made of Rain. 2020. <laughs> excellent choice, Frank. Excellent. Excellent. It's, I'm, gr- I'm, I'm very happy to see that in your top, in your top three. Um, okay. Number three, Book of Days. Their sixth album. 1989 produced by david allen who did the cure chameleons the first and last and always from sisters of mercy okay so when you juxtapose uh midnight to midnight in this album that followed the furs became much more raw dark way less polished exactly i think what they needed to do at that moment to enter into the enter into the 90s 
Um, but just as you were talking about, this band evolved and, you know, they started off more raw, you know, way more polished, got a bit more raw and then kind of went dormant and then obviously came back with that uh, made of rain. But uh, this album was exactly what needed to happen. Um, House is my number one favorite on this one. Um, you know, and obviously we're going to be getting into the songs, but, you know, top tier psychedelic for first song right there house uh the title track book of days and then uh number three i'm gonna go with should god forget that is my number three book of days i feel like this is an album that a lot of people don't know in their catalog and uh if you're watching this get a copy book of days number three Hopefully you haven't turned off the video yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I'll put down the first couple albums so you know that we're obviously going to stand Book of Days pretty hard. There's two records left and it's got to be in one of mine, right? So that yeah. said, number two, number two for me though, is the debut record. So, you know, there you have it. The debut record from 1980, uh, Psychedelic Furs, self-titled album. I have, yeah, I have the same pressing Brett was talking about with Susan Strange and Soap Commercial in here, Martin Hannett Productions. I don't love that. I prefer the cover that obviously looks like this, but it's pink, uh, the UK version. And for me, that kind of dings it for me a little bit. Uh, I don't, I think that so those songs kind of irritate the flow of the LP, whereas the rest of it is just loud. It's a statement of intent. They come roaring out of the gates. Uh, this song is completely influential to me as a bass player, uh, as far as like Bauhaus, The Cure, Psychedelic Furs. I talk about it regularly. Um, so the two songs we covered off this actually were Flowers, which we did regularly. That was so much fun to play live, just to really dig in that like groaning A note bass line. That's my second favorite track on the record. My third, I'm gonna go in a weird order on this one. My third favorite track on this is We Love You, which I also covered once. We Love You is such a ceremonial song talking about what he loves, like Frank Sinatra, The Supremes, Baby Love. We, but love we did you. it as a, yeah, we did it as a scathing put down to a festival we were put on that were very unkind to us. So we kind of did it as like a little, yeah, you know, like kind of put that energy into it. And, um, Oh, something I want to talk about. It's not my favorite track on here, but I think this record's got like hip hop vibes into it. It's like art rock hip hop. Songs mm. like a wedding song, just kind of like just kind of spitting. He just mm. really spits the stream of consciousness. Lyrics on this just always impress me. But my favorite song on this one is going to be the gloomy, sax ridden uh, Sister Europe. It's oh, yes. intense, it's powerful, it is so dreamy. I mean, everyone says, oh, I don't like saxophone. That's, that's how it should be used. It's got that Bowie that's aladdin sane kind of like darkness mystery to it and it's beautiful uh so yeah there you have it 1980s first psychedelic furs album a classic influential record to me as a musician and my number two great choice great choice all right these top two the even up to this morning i was saying to sarah god i feel like flip flop flip flip flopping these and um uh i kept it i kept it the list intact but um yeah, this was my number one for a while. Made of Rain. Frank already talked about this. Their first album in 29 years. Sarah said something interesting about this. Um, is she compared it to the last couple of suede records after their hiatus? The production of it and just how, you know, there's very few bands that can come back after a hiatus and create work that rivals their best work i mean here we are yours was number three mine was number two and we don't take these picks lightly it's not just randomly put, popping these things in there there's deep familiarity with them but this record is um it's it's dark the sound of it the production is exactly what it should be all the songs it's one of those albums that is is a an, uh, uh, an entirety piece like from beginning to end, it sounds great all combined. Um, obviously, there's some standout tracks that that I'm going to mention like you did, but they work best as a complete album. Um, this one was produced by Richard Fortas, who was who Richard Butler started uh, Love Spit Love with. So that was interesting to see. And I have to give a nod to um, keyboard player Amanda Kramer, who's been playing with them for years, who is a member of Information Society, if you're wondering why that record's up there above me. Um, so a little shout out to Amanda Kramer there. Um, Frank, you already said it, but Wrong Train, 
number one song, the song I've been waiting to have a proper recording of for years. Um, you know, they it was on that 2001 House of Blues DVD where they played it live. And then there was, I remember having an MP3 of it from some radio session that they did in like 2001 or something. And you're just like, why is this song just this lost artifact? Why don't we have it on an album? And I mean, it's not like it came in a, in a poorly, you know, rearranged version. <laughs> I mean, it is just outstanding. Once again, I'm going to say top tier psychedelic fur songs. My second favorite track, No One, which is super emotional and chilling. And you already said it, the emotional hard hitting. This will never be like love. A, an amazing song, but really the whole album. So that is my number two pick. So um, we obviously know what each other's number one picks are. So at this time, let's hold up our little paper to see if if we were right. So Frank, what did you think my number one would be? Talk, talk, talk. Oh, talk, talk. interesting. Talk, 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 talk. All right. Great surprise. Here, here we go. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he knew it. And you know, I'm, you know, that was also I've been very vocal. About yes, that. yes. I, you know, I can admit we had conversations <laughs> about the furs, and it seemed it seemed to be um, something that uh, that stuck in the back of my mind. But like like I am, Frank is very thorough and is going to not just go with what his recollection of these albums. We're going to completely reevaluate. I listen to yeah. you know, these are albums that stay in rotation for me. But when, when I approach these rankings, it usually encompasses several weeks of re-listens because I want to I want to have a, you know, a 2023 viewpoint on this now, not my recollection of, of albums from from years ago. So um, so I was thinking that would be your number one. But, um, you know, things can change. Yeah. So, yeah, so it really was. And it's it, and like I said, at the beginning of this video, it's the first one I heard. And you always gravitate towards the first one that blew your mind. Uh, like I said, a girlfriend sat me down, played Torch on a couch, maybe in maybe been some making out during it. I'm not, you know, <laughs> let's, let's be honest. And then really Torch, uh, that song just floored me, like played at my funeral. It's so perfect. So to soak it up. And then but this whole record, uh, Brett already said it, David, David M. Allen, who did a, a, Amongst Chameleon Sisters and Cure, also did the associates and wire right. uh two other favorites of you know like mm -hmm. of the post-punk era wire especially and he just knocks it out of the park there's a, a, a swirling heavy vibe to it that has that like you know disintegration wish wish and kiss me feel three records that david allen produced so it's you know i think it, you know we can talk about how great the cure are and how great the furs are but the production on those records really adds to it so this has got a love it's got a level of like it's it, it's forward looking. I feel it's a, like Brett said. It's looking towards the '90s. It's got that alternative rock sound. It's like all the stuff that was coming out that was like heavier REM or like Killing Joke or things that were influencing what was going to be, you know, grunge didn't come out of nowhere, right? You know, so this sort of had this this level of like power to it, and certainly uh, this record delivers on that. And it's a great comeback, as you will. Uh, it's this classic. So it, it's. It beats it beats out the first record, which I was always in the record saying as an influence. But really, it I did listen to it. I was wondering if that would change, but it didn't. So my favorite three songs I already talked about: Torch. Uh, my second favorite song here is House. Mm. Also a perfect single. They played it live when I saw them. I DJed it recently at a recent night, which was mostly like you know lounge listening. But House has just got a lot of power to it. It's you can sing. There's like secret lyrics in some of the songs and. I love that. Um, and in the third song, I kind of, this was one of those albums where I kind of had like four or five favorites on here. And I think I chose Book of Days today, which kind of had that swirling snake pit vibe, but it could just as well be Entertain Me or mm -hmm. anything off this record. This record's just perfect. I love it. I, I can't. No, Mother, Son, Parade, I, Book of Days. And again, if you haven't heard this one or if you've skipped it, get into it. Just, you're missing out. Agreed. All right. So, that was the first first uh, record that you ever heard. This was the first one that I ever heard. Yes. Topsy Turvy. That's yeah, that was, this was your number eight. This is my number one. That's what's so great about about doing these lists. I never would have expected that. Yeah. So um, this album just epitomizes the 1980s for me. It's just when I hear these songs, it just brings back 
uh, such a great a great feeling. Um, and and as you mentioned about you know high wire days being you know closing track and I mean there are some heavy hitters on this album. It's for me um, when I think about you know kind of one of these things people talk about is albums that have a one two three track listing punch out of the gate. When I think of where the streets have no name i still haven't found what i'm looking for with or without you those three songs you think about how just um what an intro for an album and this one has the ghost in you here come cowboys and then heaven but for me it never lets up you know sometimes albums will have these great songs and the rest is filler um but you know you already mentioned heartbeat high wire days and um oh and then alice's house but uh, yeah, so produced by Keith Forsey, who did Billy Idol, Ice House, and he actually wrote Don't You Forget About Me that Simple Minds ended up recording. Ah, which was a Billy Idol song in its own right, wasn't it? Yes. Partially pitched to him? There you go. So uh, just, just kind of like, just kind of a, a, an interesting combination. So um, three favorites. I cannot deny the ghost in you. To me, it's one of the greatest songs ever written. Um, you covered it once on a stream, didn't you? I've heard you I sure it. did. Uh, that the song tracks, is, the tracks. it's just uh, a beautiful, emotional track. Number two, I'm going to go with Heaven. And number three, Like a Stranger. That little staccato soprano sax that accents the chorus is just, per it's just perfection. So... We'll talk more about this in my in, in the in our in our song ranking in my song ranking list and dive into this uh, more. But that is my number one. Uh, Mirror moves from 1984, which was their fourth fourth record. Well, shows what I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, that's Frank and and our cho uh, my choices for the first albums. Like I said, we're going to be posting a video a follow up video on our 25 favorite songs. And we'll be posting that most likely tomorrow. So be sure to check in for that. See you guys soon. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Bye-bye.